So let's try and think about why it might be or how we could start approaching simulation using a quantum computer. We're going to be thinking about a, um, there's a way we can simplify how we can start thinking about simulating quantum systems, which is to assume that the interactions happening between different parts of the system are local. So this means that the, the kind of the qubits that we're thinking about to model these physical parts of the system, the physical parts that are able to interact are the ones that are close to each other and the ones further apart are not interacting. And this assumption of only, um, only particles or parts of the system that are close to each other are interacting and parts that are far apart are not interacting is a valid physical assumption in most cases or in a lot of cases that we're interested in um, because it means that um, because in general if you have greater distances or greater differences in energy between states then you will have less interaction between those parts. So let's call this local interactions because we're working within this um, view that we're interested in systems where we can make the assumption that they're interacting locally rather than distant parts of the system are interacting. So, um, so something I should mention from our previous discussion of subsystems is that when we were looking at this subsystem that can vary according to theta, this means that the Hamiltonian that we're interested in here can actually vary over time. So we'll want to distinguish between these Hamiltonians that can vary over time and a Hamiltonian that does not vary over time because it leads to being able to do different kinds of computations with them. So let's assume we've got a Hamiltonian that is not varying over time. So H is time independent. And it's in this case that we can use the equation that we uh, derived earlier, or well, showed that is a solution to the Schrodinger equation earlier, which is this. So here's our Hamiltonian again. And we want to find a way of simulating the Hamiltonian. But in general, if we just have a Hamiltonian of our entire system as a whole, it's going to be very complicated to take the exponential of it. So how can we start simplifying this down? Well, we said we can split our system. We've assumed local interactions. So this means that we can split the Hamiltonian into a sum of smaller Hamiltonians that are each acting on only a few qubits. So we can write this like this. So let's say um, we split it into L, um, L parts and then we have these and um, these each act on a kind of a small number of systems. So for example, um, it might be that uh, H1 is um, X3, X4. So that means that it's an X gate applied to qubit um, three and an X gate applied to qubit four. Or H2 might be Z3, or Z5, so it's a, um, a Z gate applied to qubit five. And um, yeah, so we can have the, um, these uh, 
Hamiltonians corresponding to interactions between different uh, qubits or just acting on a single qubit as well. Um, right, so we have the, there's some kind of good news and bad news here. Let's say the good news is that um, this, the exponential of the smaller Hamiltonian, because it's acting on a smaller subsystem, this is um, easier to approximate with quantum circuits. Than, um, than the big Hamiltonian that we started out with. So um, we have these, um, yeah, smaller chunks that we can actually approximate with quantum circuits. So we can start to see that we'll be able to um, create a circuit that enables us to simulate the action of that Hamiltonian. The bad news, is that we can't rely on our operators commuting the H case. So all we've shown so far is that e to the minus i H t can be broken down into e to the minus i um, sum, okay, H k t, but we, are not allowed to go from that to minus i h1 e to the minus i h2 and so on. Um, so it's not equal to the sum of the exponentials of these smaller um, Hamiltonians. So we haven't solved our problem yet because we don't know how to use our good news in order to um, simulate our bigger Hamiltonian. But luckily there is a solution. And um, I will get the golden pen out again, just because it's as a solution to this. Um, the Trotter formula will come to the rescue. So let's see what the Trotter formula is. The um, oh, and I just should mention earlier that if um, this is if the HK don't commute. And if they do commute, then everything is fine and we can actually um, we can actually perform that transformation, um, which you can try yourself just to check from, from the rules we showed earlier. So let's get to the Trotter formula, which is gonna save us from our bad news. And this is the following formula. So we have the limit of n going to infinity, e to the i. Um, so let's say we have two Hermitian operators, um, a and b, then e to the i a t over h bar, e to the i b t over h bar, um, all to the power of n. As we take the limit of n tends to infinity of this expression, we get e to the i a plus b t. Um, and for real t's. 
So this is great because it gives us a way of translating from um, sums of operators to products of the exponentials of those operators, which then lets us use our good news that the exponentials of the products are easier to simulate. And some useful outcomes of the Trotter formula are that we can um, use it when we want to do approximations of um, when we want to do approximations of the sum of the operators. So some useful results that come out from applying this formula are we have the exponential of two of the sum of two operators. We can approximate it as the product of plus some um, error, which will be of order delta t squared, where delta t is our um, time difference that we're looking at. And we can um, go uh, a step better by using a um, another approximation where we can express our results in terms of this product of the operators. And so then we can do better because now we've got our result, which only has an error of order delta t cubed if we um, use this product of the three exponentials. So the Trot formula is very useful for being able to derive these kinds of results where we can um, find ways to turn our exponential of a sum into a product of exponentials. And I won't prove the formula today because there isn't um, much time, but it's something that you can uh, you can work through the proof. It just needs a bit of a, yeah, just a basically expanding out the exponentials um, in terms of their Taylor expansion and then multiplying those together and kind of keeping terms of first order and then looking at what happens when you um, make n large and then the formula comes out. So let's um, move on to thinking about um, So let's think about what happens when we want to simulate the, um, the Schrodinger equation, because that's kind of where we started with all this right at the beginning. So when we're um, looking at the Schrodinger equation, we saw earlier that we can um, express the Hamiltonian of a single particle in terms of this um, momentum operator, which is the d2 by dx squared term that we um, had before, plus vx, which is the potential, um, is the position operator. And we can write out our wave function in terms of this um, integral and then um, we can actually just consider this. So we've considered the, the quantum state between kind of the position minus infinity and infinity like the positions very, yeah, either end of all the positions a particle can be in. But in practice, we're only thinking about the evolution in a finite space. And so we can just um, 
limit it to some uh, distances, let's call it, um, let's say we go from x1 to x2. And um, what we can also do is approximate our um, integral so that instead of thinking about the continuous spectrum of what's happening at every single point in space, we're just looking at discrete chunks of what's happening at different points in space. And um, so each with a set interval in between them. So we're actually going to approximate this as a discrete sum. And we can go from having some um, if our time steps, if our uh, space steps are delta x, each uh, interval written like this to have a total um, to go through a total distance of d. And we can write our ket like this so that um, we will see that it uh, it moves from we express the the state from minus um, from the position minus d when k is minus d over delta x to plus d when the state is plus d over delta x. So we're going from um, yeah from some position minus d to d. Those are the positions we're looking at. So now we have this um, expression in terms of a uh, a sum of these individual chunks. We can then look at um, we can model this state by a a uh, quantum state with some number of qubits. And um, the number of qubits that we'll need in this state, we're going to need enough qubits that we can have a different state from minus d over delta x all the way to d over delta x. And um, the since each of our um, Each of our bits in the state can take um, one of two states, then it will. Um, so the, the total number of steps we have is 2d over delta x plus one, because we have the ones on either side and zero. And this is going to equal, we need this to equal 2 to the n because that's how many um, ways our computational basis state can be. And so n is log 2d over delta x plus 1. And now what you'll notice here is that we have um, reduced our problem because instead of trying to um, instead of trying to use two to the n complex numbers to characterize this state, we can use n qubits. So that's where we get this advantage of using qubits instead of uh, classical computers. And what we can then do is, um, well, we notice that our operators in our Hamiltonian don't commute. So we're going to need to use the um, tricks from earlier and if we um what we can do is compute the exponentials of these hamiltonians individually and then we would be able to combine them using the tricks from earlier and since our states are in the position basis, they're already in the basis where v is diagonal. And so that means that um, we can um, 
we know that it will map a state, it will have an eigenvalue of e to the minus i v k delta x delta t. And then what we're going to do with the momentum operator is to, we can actually change that to also be in the position basis using something called a, um, we can introduce the, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. So if we represent transforming it, um, well, you can transform something from position to momentum using the Fourier transform, which is this um, evolution of this gate that I've written U F F T. And then this is, this allows us to know that the momentum operator will transform a basis state to the state where we have this transformation. Um, sorry, VK. And this maps the basis state to this state. So by doing various manipulations, we can reduce our simulation of the Schrodinger equation to simulating these individual Hamiltonians of the, um, the different subparts of the overall Hamiltonian. So now that we have seen um, the general process of the kinds of things, we're just going to summarize some ideas about the um, Fourier transform and what that means and why it's useful. So let's have a look at the Fourier transform. So there is an algorithm called the quantum Fourier transform, which allows us to um, perform the Fourier transform of amplitudes of a quantum state in a way that is much faster than what a classical computer could do. Um, it doesn't allow us to perform Fourier transforms of classical, um, to perform usual Fourier transforms that we can do any faster than a classical computer because of the difficulty in retrieving the information from measuring a quantum state. But we can use this technique of the quantum Fourier transform within various other algorithms. And it's actually extremely useful for that reason. And so um, just some examples of what it's useful for is it plays a role in, um, in factoring large numbers, which is one of the famous uh, initial applications of quantum computers that is shown by Shaw's algorithm. And it's, um, useful for phase estimation, which is where you can approximate the eigenvalues of a unitary operator. And I'll explain a bit about that as well. So the, um, yeah, the general idea of Fourier transforms is that we can take something that's kind of in a difficult space and move it to a solvable space through the transform. And I'm just going to write it as FT. And in the quantum case, that's kind of transforming one quantum state to a different quantum state, um, which is useful in different situations. So um, there's something called a uh, a discrete Fourier transform, which is defined so that if you have a list of numbers, so let's say A1, 
to an, then um, it will map them to b to our next to a, a new set of numbers where a general one of these numbers can be written like this. So um, this is if we have n total numbers. And um, the quantum version of this is basically doing this with uh, quantum states. So we start with our basis states in some basis, um, and they are transformed to different states. And the way that they are transformed is that a, say, general state, which we denote by the label J, is transformed to um, this state, which you'll see looks very similar to well, the same as the equation that I wrote above, but with quantum states. And so um, we're doing the Fourier transform, but of quantum states instead of uh, just a list of numbers. So um, we can write what happens when we do the Fourier transform of, um, of an overall state, then we find that the coefficients of the new um, of the new state will be given by the discrete Fourier transform. And we can do this. Um, it turns out that the Fourier transform is unitary. The, dis the quantum Fourier transform operation is unitary. <coughs> this is nice because it means that we can do it on a quantum computer. Great. So, um, and I won't go through the actual uh, expression for the quantum Fourier transform, but just as an example, if you wanted to do it with um, three, do a Fourier transform on three qubits, um, this is the circuit that you would need. Um, so this here is a swap gate, which we haven't, uh, might not have mentioned before, but that just swaps the two qubits and the other gates we have covered before. So this is a three qubit Fourier tra transform. And where, yeah, one place that this comes in useful is for phase estimation. So let's have a summary of that. So the problem that we're faced with when we want to do phase estimation is that we have a unitary gate that acts on some state. And we know that it has some uh, eigenvalue. So let's write this as e to the 2 pi i phi u. And what we want to determine is this phi. So that's what we want to know, what is the parameter in this eigenvalue. So we're going to make some um, yeah, assumptions of things we can do. So basically the things we need to be able to do to do this estimation of the phase is we need to be able to prepare you well, we'll see how we can relax this later, but we need to be able to prepare you. And we need to be able to apply um, controlled gates of some number of U's. So, um, yeah, controlled U to the um, two to the J. So, um, 
day is some integer and we need to be able to apply um, controlled gates, so control U. So just as a reminder, if our control qubit is zero, then we don't apply U. And if the control qubit is one, then we apply U. And um, yeah, so we need to be able to apply these gates. So let's just have, um, so the phase estimation happens in a few stages. So let's look at the first stage, let's call it stage one, and how this works is we start with uh, two registers. So we have the first register and the second register. The first register is a set of qubits that are all in the zero state. And um, the number of qubits that we need in the first register will depend on how much we want to, um, how well we want to estimate the accuracy of phi and how, uh, with what probability we want to get a correct answer. And then the second register, so let's just write that, that we have um, these T, the first register. And then in the second register, we just have the state U. So that could be however many qubits we need to characterize that state. And then what we do is we do a Hadamard transform on the first register. So that means you apply a Hadamard to each of the qubits. And then we do a series of controlled gates from the first register to the second. So um, we do a um, We do our first control gate from the um, bottom qubit is a control of u to the power of um, two to the zero. And then we continue this um, pattern where we go u applied two to the one times u two to the two and so on until we have u to the um, two to the t plus one uh, to, um, no, that should actually be two t minus one times. So we have two to the t minus one. Um, and then the, let's add in the controls. This is controlled of the second qubit. This, the next one, and this on the t minus one, uh, on the teeth teeth qubit. And then um, we find that the outcome of the second register is still U because we've just been um, adding phases. But when we work through for the um, first register, we get an interesting uh, outcome of the state. And I will just summarize the um, overall phase estimation algorithm so we can see um, 
what's happening there. So we've seen that we have these, um, so we can use this uh, slash to denote like uh, a set of wires. So a kind of a bundle of wires. So this is just a simple way of writing the stages. So I've put H um, to denote that uh, we've applied the, um, we could denote it like this to denote that we've applied H to every qubit. And then we've done the controls of U to the to um, of each U gate that we did here. And then we have the, um, what we do at the end is an in just this. This is where our Fourier transform is coming into play. And what this does is that it means that when we measure the first register at the end in the computational basis, what we get out are the digits of, um, of the phase. So just to give an idea of what this looks like, say we have the phase is some number that's not point five, one, five, two, these are the um, individual digits. And if we have a finite number of digits, then we can describe this by this number T of, um, of bits. And so um, we can get, um, we can know phi if we know all of these T bits. And the, state that our qubits end up in after the first stage. Um, so at this point, if you do the Hadamard transform and the control gates and work through the state of the qubit, then what you will get is that we have um, zero plus e to the two pi i 0 0.5 t in the first term. And then in the second term, we have zero plus e to the two pi i 0 0.5 t. Um, so this is 5 t1, 5 t, um, no, that's 5 t, 5 t minus one, 5 t, and, so on. And so we have 0.5152 t. And then after we apply the inverse Fourier transform, Fourier transform, um, it actually simplifies this, um, this expression down to literally just being a quantum state, which is um, has each of these terms as the, um, the bit in the quantum state. So if you look at the definition of the forward Fourier transform, it's, it takes a state from this state to this set of products. And then the reverse Fourier transform um, takes us from that back to this state where um, we have all these individual components, phi one, phi two to phi t. And um, in the computational basis, each of these bits is gonna be described by, uh, yeah, it's gonna be zero or one. And so all we need to do then is measure in the computational basis, measure all our qubits in the first register. And then we, will get our outcomes and we will know what 
fires, exactly. So this seems great because we can work out phi exactly. So do a smiley face there. Um, but there are a couple of difficulties that come into play. For example, we might only know phi or um, if we have want to work out phi and it can't be written in terms of a limited number of bits or we only want to work it out to a certain um, approximate value, we can still get a good approximation by um, using this method. And we can also consider the difficulty of not necessarily being able to prepare the state u. And um, if we can't prepare the, the state u directly, then it turns out that what we can do instead is um, we can prepare, if we can prepare some other state uh, psi, say, and this um, has u as um, one of the uh, basis states, then we can get the correct outcome with some probability. So there are ways of adjusting to the fact that we might not be able to prepare our state properly and that we might only have an approximate phi, we can still do a good phase estimation. So that's the phase estimation algorithm. And now we have discussed that. We have covered our quantum simulation and a few um, aspects of quantum Fourier transforms and phase estimation quantum algorithms. Then we'll finish by talking about something which is slightly different but ties everything together in that it explains why we are interested in um, getting advantage from quantum computers in the first place. And that is the study of complexity. So what is complexity? Well, in general, with algorithms, with classical algorithms, as any algorithms, we're interested in how the time it takes for the algorithm to run varies with the input size of the problem. So we want to know if I make my problem bigger, how is the time it takes my algorithm to run going to change? And will it become intractable for me to do computations for large inputs? So we can visualize this on a graph where we have input size and uh, time taken. And um, we can have different rates of different plots on this graph. So one thing we could have is a exponential plot where we increase the input size a bit and the time taken shoots up. We can also have polynomial um, plots where the input size increases, where the time taken increases with input size, but not in such a way that it becomes intractable. And in general, we say that we can simulate uh, that po polynomial time is good, we can do efficiently, and exponential time is bad. We can't scale up um, exponential time algorithms. And 
just as some examples here, something like multiplication is we can do in polynomial time with a classical computer. But with a classical computer, we um, need exponential time to do factorization of a number into its prime factors. But what we can do with quantum is shift the complexity from 2 to the n to n squared with, um, with Shor's algorithm. And so new computers, new ways of computing, actually allows us to shift where we're at on these plots from the bad side to the good side of exponential to polynomial. And the way we summarize this is through different uh, complexity classes. So they tell us kind of what different computers are able to do, what broad types of problems they are capable of. So we can express this on a diagram if we put, uh, let's say our first, our middle class is polynomial. So we'll just write this as uh, P and this denotes a polynomial. So that's problems that can be solved in polynomial time on a deterministic computer. So that's a classical computer that is deterministic. So it can't um, use probabilities to compute things. And there is a wider class of problems that can be solved by a computer that is probabilistic. And so um, that can be solved by, a, and so this kind of computer can solve all the ones that can be solved by the deterministic one in polynomial time, because you can just adjust the probabilities so it's deterministic. Um, but it can also solve a wider class of problems in polynomial time. And that's denoted by BPP, which stands for uh, Bounded Error Probabilistic um, Polynomial Time. And the exciting part for us is that it looks like we have a wider class than this, which is um, Q, uh, BQP. And this is the class of things which a quantum computer can solve in polynomial time. And a quantum computer can solve everything that a probabilistic one can do in polynomial time and everything that a deterministic one can do in polynomial time and more. So something like factorization of a number into its primes is in the BQP class. And that stands for um, bounded error quantum polynomial time. So just, um, yeah, that's how we have these different classes that we use to identify where we're getting a quantum advantage is where we're solving problems that are within this wider class. And just to finish off, we'll discuss some notation that we use when talking about complexity classes. And this we call um, big O notation. So you will see this round when kind of with comparing different algorithms and how fast they are. And the way we use big O notation is we use it to kind of capture the, um, the fastest way that our uh, problems execution time is increasing with um, with input with problem input size. So if the input size is characterized by number n, then 
let's say the execution time um, increases as uh, n plus 3n plus uh, n to the 4, then the um, we say that the time increases as order n to the 4. So that's big O with n to the 4. So we just take the biggest way that it is evolving. Another example, 3n squared would just be order n squared. Um, we could also have something of order n. And you can also have something of order e to the n or e to the n to the a third. And as it turns out, we can, with classical computers, we can do multiplication with order n squared. We can't do it with order n. We can do addition with order n. And factorization requires at least order n to the third exponential of n to the third, which is exponential. So we can compare that to the um, order n squared that we can get with um, with quantum computers. So that's the big O notation that you will see around when discussing complexity. So that is all I wanted to cover today. So to summarize what we've looked at today, we have gone through what Hamiltonians are and the Schrodinger equation, looked at how subsystems can evolve over time and describing them individually by a Hamiltonian, looking at when we want to simplify expressions for the exponential of a sum of uh, Hamiltonians, which we needed to, um, because we were looking at Hamiltonians of systems by looking at local interactions in the system, splitting it into a sum of individual Hamiltonians, and then approximating that exponential of a sum as an exponential, as a product of exponentials using this Trotter formula. And then we looked at some other useful algorithms that come into play for the simulations, which are the quantum Fourier transform. And we saw how that is useful for quantum phase estimation. And then we finished by looking at complexity classes and big O notation to see how we can actually compare different algorithms and how good or bad and how efficient they are. And that brings me to the end of the lecture. I hope you found it useful to think about how, what Hamiltonians are and how quantum systems evolve and enjoy the rest of the summer school. Bye.